Hello, welcome back. This is your host, Edward Halperin, the Chancellor and CEO of New York Medical College and the Provost for Biomedical Affairs at Turo University, and it's COVID-19 webinar number 21. The pandemic goes on and on and takes twists and turns, but you can rely on one thing. We'll be here every five to six weeks to give you the latest information about the pandemic and help those of you who are healthcare practitioners, help your patients and help those of you who are simply interested, uh, members of the public and parents and grandparents about how to help take care of your family. As usual, we got some old friends, we got some new friends to join us for today's webinar. I've invited an old friend back, Professor Chander Bakshi from New York Medical College, who's gonna teach us all about how in the world are you gonna design a vaccine for COVID-19 when it keeps mutating. Next, I've invited Dr. Ted Barrett of the Lovelace Biomedical Research Institute of Albuquerque, New Mexico, to tell us all about the new vaccine which has come on the market, so-called Novavax, and tell you how it compares to those already on the market. You'll then hear from me for a brief history of vaccines and to tell you about the general types of vaccines. And then it's time for two of your fan favorites. Dr. Marissa Montecalvo is back and she's gonna tell us what you're supposed to do if you get diagnosed with COVID and you've already been vaccinated. Are you supposed to take one of the oral drugs or you're supposed to get monoclonal antibodies? or is it chicken soup and rest? And I know that for a lot of you, it doesn't matter what your doctor says, it doesn't matter what your family says, you're not doing anything unless Marissa Montecalvo says it's okay. So don't worry, Marissa's back to tell us what to do. And then a second one of your fan favorites is here to wrap up our program. Yep, Dr. Robert Amler is back and it's August, which means Dr. Amler, is here to tell us what you need to know about sending the kids back to school in a pandemic. He always dispenses advice in the spring about whether you can send them to summer camp, and he's back to tell us about kids going back to school. As always, if you have a question for any of our panelists, type it in, in the Q&A box on your computer screen. We'll monitor them, and we'll get to the Q&A portion of our program with Dr. Alan Kadish the president of the Turo University system. He'll be our moderator, and we'll try to get as many of your questions answered as possible, but please type them in in the Q&A box. For those of you interested in continuing medical education credit or for making a donation to support these webinars, you will see me appear in between some of the panelists' talks to tell you how to get your CME credit and other information. Welcome back, and let's get started with our program. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining. Uh, my name is Chandrasekhar Bakshi, and I'm an associate professor of pathology, microbiology, and immunology at New York Medical College. So in the past two years, what we have observed is SARS-CoV-2 virus, uh, the causative agent of COVID-19, it keeps mutating. And now the question is, how do scientists design vaccines to keep up with the mutations? So in today's presentation, I'm going to give, in, give you an overview of the approaches that are being taken uh, to update the currently available vaccines. So I have no conflicts to declare. So let's first start with the design of the current COVID-19 vaccine. So the current COVID-19 vaccine uses the spike protein of the original Wuhan isolate of SARS-CoV-2. Uh, and this spike protein is the major attachment protein. And I'm going to talk particularly about these two vaccines, that is Moderna and Pfizer, which uses uh, these uh, two uh, uh, vaccines use the mRNA of the spike protein of Wuhan isolate. And when it is injected, the spike protein is synthesized in our body and it induces an antibody and cell-mediated immune response. And these vaccines were great in protecting from severe disease and hospitalization. And then came the variants of the SARS-CoV-2. So what happened, the SARS-CoV-2 underwent a number of mutations that also changed the spike protein uh, in these variants, alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. 
And then when this when the vaccine which was directed against the original Wuhan stain was used, the reduced protection was observed. And at this stage, a third booster was also recommended to bump up the vaccine uh, to bump up the, the protective uh, efficacy of the vaccine. So, uh, so until Delta variant, it was uh, the vaccines were still working, and then came the Omicron variant, which accumulated about 37 mutations in the spike protein, and that totally changed the nature of the virus. So, as a result, the efficacy of the of both the Moderna and Pfizer vaccine was, was drastically reduced, um, uh, and the the protection was uh, from the severe disease was reduced. And at this stage, uh, the fourth booster was also recommended. But that was not also effective in um, enhancing the protective efficacy against the subvariants of the Omicron variant. So now we need to update the first generation vaccines or develop the new COVID-19 vaccine to control this uh, rapidly emerging SARS-CoV-2 uh, variants. So what are, the, what are the different approaches? The first approach that was taken um, to improve the currently available vaccine was to develop a variant adapted vaccine. And the approach was very simple, is to replace the spike protein of the, uh, of the Wuhan strain with, the, with that of the variant. And because the technology was available and based on this uh, concept, uh, two vaccines were developed. One, uh, the beta adapted vaccine by Moderna and uh, Pfizer uh, announced uh, an Omicron adapted uh, vaccine last month. However, these variant adapted vaccines are intended only for use as boosters because they cannot be used for primary vaccination. And it has also been shown in the study that Omicron adapted monovalent and bivalent vaccine, um, when they used as a fourth booster, they elicit a very high uh, increase uh, in the neutralizing titers uh, against the Omicron BA.1. But there are several shortcomings of the variant adapted vaccine. And the most important is what is called as immune printing. That, is when the, that means that when a booster vaccination against a new variant is given, it will not trigger a response against the new variant, but it would rather result in boosting the effect of the old vaccine. And this is what was observed with the beta adapted uh, vaccine, which was developed by Moderna. So uh, because these, the, 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 these individuals are initially uh, uh, immunized with the Wuhan strain, and then this was the beta adapted variant, which was given as a booster. As you can see that this resulted in the enhancement of the antibodies uh, that were generated against the conserved spike two, uh, spi uh, SARS-CoV-2 spike epitopes, which were basically directed against the Wuhan strain but there was a very little uh, or the suppressed neutralizing antibody response was observed against the beta variant of SARS-CoV-2. And this may uh, get further uh, enhanced, you know, if a variant adapted vaccine is used against another variant, like for example, Delta or Omicron. So immune Im imprinting is a, is, a, is a big issue that is associated with variant adapted vaccine. And this is also uh, seen with this Omicron adapted uh, candidate because it, uh, it can neutralize BA1 very efficiently, but the efficiency of the neutralizing antibodies goes down by threefold against the BA.4 and BA.5 subvariants of Omicron vaccine. So what is the next strategy? So the next strategy is to develop a hybrid vaccine. So, so this indicate this this means that to develop a hybrid vaccine by introducing or by including both old and new forms of the spike protein, as it is shown here. So this is the wild type backbone of the Wuhan virus, and then you introduce all the mutations that were accumulated in Delta and Omicron variant to make a hybrid uh, spike protein or a hybrid uh, receptor binding domain of the spike protein. So receptor binding domain is the one that comes in contact with the cell surface, uh, the ACE2 receptor present on our cell. So this uh, in the experimental studies has given a really good immune response, but the major concern with the hybrid vaccine is that uh, uh, as to how often this vaccine need, need to be reformulated uh, or updated uh, to remain effective and keep the variants under control. Uh, and again, this uh, hybrid vaccine may also uh, encounter the same uh, phenomena of immune imprinting, where the, the, the immune response is boosted against the original vaccine and not the vaccine directed against the variants. 
So the third vaccine uh, strategy, which is being adopted uh, and it's in experimental stages, is to develop a pen coronavirus or a universal vaccine. Uh, so this uh, uh, vaccine technology uses the technology that was developed in Oxford University, uh, uses this uh, mesh-like nanoparticles, and then you can decorate the surface of these nanoparticles uh, with the receptor binding domain. So you can use the homotypic uh, 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 receptor binding domain. That means the that means the receptor binding domains from one strain of or one variant of SARS-CoV-2, or you can generate a mosaic where you can take uh, the receptor binding domain from uh, uh, from SARS-CoV-2, as well as from other coronaviruses, uh, including the one from bats and animals. So this is what they did in this particular study. So they created this Mosaic 8 vaccine in which they use the receptor binding domain of SARS-CoV-2 uh, beta variant, and then the receptor binding domains from uh, coronaviruses uh, of a bat and animal origin. And when this uh, mosaic vaccine was used for immunization, uh, they could induce the protective neutralizing antibodies against all the coronaviruses that they tested, even though these uh, the RBD domains of these viruses were not included. So, uh, and they have also shown some protection. So these studies are going on. So this appears to be a really promising vaccine. Um, and this is, uh, uh, this strategy is going to be the, uh, the most successful in my opinion uh, to control uh, the new emerging variants or, or new strains of coronaviruses. So the fourth strategy that should be adopted is uh, to develop a mucosal or an intranasal vaccine. And the reason is that this is what happens when we are naturally infected with SARS-CoV-2. So we develop a systemic immune response, which is mostly driven by IgG type of antibodies, but we also develop a mucosal immune response, which is driven by the IgA type of antibodies. But when we take a vaccine, which is delivered intramuscularly, we mostly develop um, systemic immune response, IgG1, IgG driven response, but we do not uh, induce any mucosal immune response. So the strategy should be such that the vaccine can be delivered intranasally so that we can get an immune response which is induced similar to what we see in the natural infection, that is the mucosal immunity. So that can prevent the virus um, or, or reduce the viral load at the primary portal of entry, which is the nasal mucosa. And they, then we also have the systemic immunity. And that's why there are a number of companies are jumping into this race and they are trying to develop a nasal vaccination that can be taken as a nasal spray. Uh, and that is going expected to induce uh, mucosal immunity. So to summarize what I have told you today, uh, so SARS-CoV-2 virus is constantly changing uh, very quickly and easily. And this is what is seen with the influenza virus because this virus also changes very quickly and easily. And that's why each year uh, the, the flu vaccine is made six uh, months in advance. And that includes uh, the, the, the type of the influenza virus that is circulating or predicted to circulate. Um, and then that's why we have to take this vaccine uh, every year annually, you know, because the virus is uh, changing. And probably this is what is going to happen uh, with the COVID-19 as well, or COVID-19 vaccines as, as well, because we will have to reformulate this vaccine uh, or vaccines each year based on the type of the circulating variants or the type of the variant that are predicted to be there. And then we will have to take this vaccine uh, every six monthsly, depending on how quickly the variants are emerging or annually. Um, so, uh, so this is what uh, the future is going to be. Uh, and with that, I will stop here and thank you so much for your attention. Hello again, this is Dr. Edward Halpern, your host telling you how to get your continuing medical education credits. As always, we got lots of choices to get your CME credit. You can get out that cell phone and send a text message to 828-295-1144 and put in your text message 95WANS. If you do that, you're going to get a text message back telling you how to do your satisfaction questionnaire and how to get your credit. If you don't want to do a text message, type in www.eeds.com, click the sign in button, put in the same code, 95WANS, W-A-N-S, and it'll walk you through the process. Or get out that QR reader on your handheld device, scan the code, and you'll find yourself in the right place 
to apply for your CME credit and answer your satisfaction questionnaire with today's program. These codes are gonna expire on Monday, August 29th. Let me strongly suggest you take a screenshot or you write this down and don't wait because you don't wanna be frustrated that you didn't get your CME credit when you had the chance. As always, if you have a question for our panelists, go ahead and type it in the Q&A box and we'll get to as many as we can when Dr. Kadish moderates our Q&A at the end of our panel presentations. And now back to our program. Well, thank you everybody. I'm Ted Barrett from uh, Loveless Biomedical and I'm uh, happy to be able to present uh, a little bit of information today about uh, the newest uh, vaccine uh, for COVID-19, uh, the Novavax vaccine. I have no conflicts of interest to disclose uh, for today's presentation. But let's start with a little bit of a review uh, in terms of there, there are 11 vaccines that have been granted emergency use uh, by the WHO. And of those 11, four have been approved by the US FDA, uh, where the Novavax vaccine, Novavax vaccine is the most recent uh, to be approved uh, uh, this past summer. And it's a little bit different uh, than the uh, vaccines we're more familiar with from uh, Moderna, Pfizer, and uh, the J&J &J vaccine and that it's based on a sub protein subunit approach. And we'll get into that a little bit more here. Uh, but what I find interesting as well is, uh, wow, there, there have been a lot of trials uh, for these vaccines and they're approved in numerous countries across the world. And then just as a reminder, there are other vaccines out there, uh, not approved in the US, but certainly being used across the world in a number of different other countries. So let's dive in a little bit and look more closely uh, at what's different uh, between the Novavax vaccine and the other vaccines we're more some familiar with. As I mentioned, the Novavax vaccine is based on the idea of using a component of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, uh, the, the spike protein, and that protein is generated uh, and purified and then combined with an adjuvant uh, to generate the vaccine that's gonna trigger an Im immune response in the patient uh, to hopefully provide uh, protection uh, from uh, SARS infection. Now in comparison, the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine take a little bit of a different approach uh, that we've all heard a lot uh, in the media uh, using an mRNA approach where essentially they take genetic material from the virus package it in a lipid nanoparticle, and then deliver that uh, to the patient to induce an immune response uh, that is protective. Now, very similarly, the J&J &J vaccine, again, delivers viral genetic material to the patient, but in a slightly different method as that's packaged into what we like to call a harmless uh, flu cold virus, uh, such as adenovirus, but again, the idea uh, triggering the patient to produce the protein inside their body versus the protein subunit approach where we're delivering the protein to the patient. So there are certainly some advantages and disadvantages across these uh, different approaches uh, to develop a vaccine. Um, so specifically for the protein subunit approach, it's quite well established. Um, we've been given uh, vaccines based on this uh, platform for tetanus, diphtheria, hepatitis B, and maybe uh, for some of us uh, most recently, the shingles vaccine is based on this approach. Now, the idea was that hopefully using this protein subunit approach, which is more familiar to, to everyone, that those who are maybe a little bit more resistant to the newer approaches might be more willing uh, to take this particular vaccine that's based on uh, older technology. So what is in the Novavax vaccine? It's really quite an interesting story and I, I encourage uh, people to maybe do a little bit of reading on their, on their own. But how it's produced is they take a recombinant form of the SARS-CoV spike protein, put that into a baculovirus, so that that baculovirus then infects insect cells 
And these insect cells are then grown up essentially in large vats, which are producing this protein that the protein can then be isolated and combined with an adjuvant where the adjuvant really serves to activate uh, the patient's uh, uh, immune system to trigger a protective immune response against uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2. Now, interestingly, the uh, adjuvant that's uh, being used uh, within the Novavax vaccine is derived from uh, saponins, which are found uh, in the Chilean soapbark tree. And we're actually all quite familiar with these as saponins are used in food uh, products from Slurpees uh, to uh, root beer as a foaming agent. Um, but in this particular case, particular saponins have been isolated that trigger a robust immune response. And in the Novavax vaccine, it's typically given as two intramuscular injections three weeks apart. Well, is it safe? Um, currently, it's approved for adults 18 and older. Um, typical common side effects that we see with other uh, vaccines, pain and soreness at the injection site, maybe some fatigue, muscle pain and nausea, perhaps some fever. Um, and these effects uh, may be more prominent uh, after the second dose. Um, there are some rare side effects that have come up uh, in the initial uh, phase three clinical trial. Uh, there were six cases of myocarditis and pericarditis, although relatively uh, small numbers. And this uh, small number of patients uh, in comparison to what we've seen to date uh, with uh, the mRNA vaccines. So how well does this uh, new vaccine work? Well, it's important to remember that the initial phase three trial occurred uh, pre-Delta and Omicron variants. So it actually works quite well uh, in the early uh, variants, 90% effective against lab-confirmed uh, symptomatic infection and 100% effective against moderate and severe disease. But there's more limited information about how well it's working against Omicron. And it's still being evaluated as whether it can be used as a, a booster uh, in combination with the other vaccines. And there's some mix and match trials uh, occurring uh, in the UK at the moment. There is a little bit of information in terms of how well it works against Omicron. Uh, there's a small uh, uh, unreviewed uh, publication in the bioarchives uh, for a study out of South Africa uh, where they looked at a small number of patients and looked at two doses versus three doses of the Novavax vaccine and how well it produces a neutralizing antibodies uh, against uh, SARS-CoV-2. And I think you can appreciate if you look at the, the third dose actually boosts up uh, the immune response and protective uh, antibodies and to cell levels that are very similar uh, to what's generated uh, by the mRNA uh, vaccine. So there is some promise here for the Novavax vaccine. So where are we heading? Well, SARS-CoV-2 is certainly not going away and there's actually quite a lot of activity. A lot of different vaccine candidates still in clinical trials, uh, hundreds going on across the world. Hopefully uh, in the fall here, we'll get some variant specific formulations, uh, specifically targeting uh, Omicron variants uh, from Moderna and Pfizer. Uh, and looking further into the future, um, there's a number of groups working on intranasal and oral delivered vaccines with the hope that that will produce kind of a more robust local immune response at the mucosal surface uh, in the upper respiratory tract that will hopefully improve the duration of action of uh, SARS vaccines. And we actually had the opportunity to work on a Gates Foundation uh, Duke University, Loveless, and Vaxart uh, collaboration to explore some of these uh, options for, for new vaccines. And of course, there's interest in combining uh, flu and SARS uh, vaccines. So thank you, everybody. That, that's uh, kind of a rapid uh, uh, look at uh, the new Nova vaccine and uh, kind of placing it in context uh, with the current vaccines. And I thank you for your time. Hello again, this is your host, Dr. Edward Halpern, hoping some of you will consider giving back to New York Medical College 
programs like you're watching today and our virology research programs take time, effort, and money. We hope you'll consider a tax-deductible gift to help offset our costs. Great things are happening here in New York Medical College. We hope you'll be a part of it. If you'd like to make a gift by phone, dial 914-594-2720. And like we say, operators are standing by to take your credit card information for a charitable donation for our COVID-19 education and research programs, or go online to www.nymc.edu slash give to do it all hands-free on the computer without having to talk to a person. And for those of you who believe in ink and pens, we'd be more than happy to receive your check made out to New York Medical College, put in the uh, memo line on your check, COVID-19 webinar support, and mail it to New York Medical College, Office of Development, 40 Sunshine Cottage Road, Valhalla, New York, 10595. Thanks for thinking of us during these challenging times. Stay safe and healthy. Please consider writing a question for one of our panelists in the Q&A box as the program continues. We'll get to as many as possible. And now let's get back to our program. It all started with a cow, a very brief history of vaccines and vaccination. I'm Edward Halperin, the Chancellor and CEO of New York Medical College and the Provost for Biomedical Affairs at Turo University. And in reference to this talk, I have no conflicts of interest to declare. Smallpox is a viral disease which was devastating throughout much of human history. The disease produced characteristic pox lesions on the skin and had a significant mortality rate. One of the first preventative measures in infectious disease based on human immune response was smallpox inoculation. Mary, Mary, Lady Mary Wortley Montague, accompanying her husband in the Ottoman Turkish Empire, observes that the Turks remove smallpox material from one person and using the lance, put it into a second person, producing some smallpox symptoms, but appearing to confer immunity against severe disease. Lady Montague is impressed by what she sees in Turkey and suffers from smallpox herself. She writes a series of letters back to England advocating for this concept of inoculation, transferring smallpox material from one person to another. Inoculation becomes widespread but highly controversial. Important supporters of smallpox inoculation in the American colonies were the famous Boston Protestant minister, Cotton Mather, who advocates for smallpox inoculation, but opponents throw a bomb through his window in the early 18th century. Fortunately for the Reverend Mather, the bomb does not go off. After losing one of his children to smallpox, Benjamin Franklin becomes an advocate for inoculation. And in Boston, in the early 18th century, the dissemination of inoculation causes a drop in the per capita death rate from smallpox. But it is not until the advent of a new technique called vaccination that smallpox is nearly eradicated. George Washington suffers from smallpox during a trip to Barbados with his brother Lawrence and is left with facial smallpox scars. Recognizing the dangers of smallpox, General Washington of the Colonial Army requires that every precaution must be used to prevent the spread of smallpox in the military camp and calls for mandatory smallpox inoculation of colonial troops. 
some military historians give Washington credit for simply having more troops in the field able to battle the British because there was no smallpox in the American camp compared to the British camp. The transition from inoculation to vaccination is credited to the self-described simple country doctor, Edward Jenner, working in the 18th and early 19th century. Jenner transfers cowpox material from the hand of Sarah Nelms, depicted here holding a bandage to her hand, and puts it into James Phipps with a lancet. The boy appears to be immune to smallpox from the use of cowpox material. Jenner has developed, therefore, a new technique as a step forward from inoculation. Who is his scientific collaborator? It is depicted in this picture. Here's Jenner on the left, but here's his collaborator, Blossom the Cow, who gave Ms. Nelms cowpox and who should be credited as a collaborator in the development of smallpox preventative measures. In this second portrait of Jenner, you once again see Blossom the Cow, in this case, next to his right arm. He writes a book, an inquiry into the causes and effects of the variola vaccine in Gloucestershire using the cowpox. He writes in English, not in Latin, and the book is published in 1798. The word cow in Latin is vaca, and in Italian and Spanish. And that's where the word vaccination comes from, from the Latin word for cow, vaca nation, vaccination, all from blossom the cow. Anti-vaxxers in the late 19th and late, eight, I'm sorry, late 18th and early 19th century think we're going to turn into cows and they disseminate anti-vaccine cartoons. Later in the 19th century, anti-vaccination agitation continues. But the conquest of smallpox can be credited to a hero of medicine, Edward Jenner. Other important developers of vaccines are Waldemar Mordechai Wolf Hafkin. Growing up in Tsarist Russia, he is denied a university appointment because he's Jewish and will not convert to the Russian Orthodox religion. He moves to France and to England, and he recognizes outbreaks of cholera and the plague in British-controlled India and modern-day Pakistan and Bangladesh. He tests vaccines on himself using attenuated microbes. You can see him in this photograph in the central image supervising distributions of new vaccines. On the upper right, the Hafkin Institute in Bombay is named in his honor. It is to Hafkin that we can credit the discovery of vaccines for cholera and the plague. Other important figures in vaccinology are Nobel laureate John Enders for the discovery of how to grow the polio virus on embryonic kidney cells. Polio vaccine developers Jonas Salk and Albert Sabin. President Franklin Roosevelt, crippled by polio and confined to a wheelchair and to driving an automobile with hand controls no foot pedals. Roosevelt is usually depicted seated because the American public was not allowed to see pictures of him in his wheelchair. The second picture from the left is rather rare. The vaudeville, radio, and movie star Eddie Cantor helps President Roosevelt and the campaign against polio by creating a slogan based on the radio show, The March of Time, except Eddie Cantor says, let's call it The March of Dimes and invite the American people to send their dimes to the White House. Roosevelt tasks lawyer Basil O'Connor 
shown in the upper left-hand image in this slide, of running the March of Dimes to conduct concerted research to conquer polio. The American people respond to mass campaigns for fundraising to deal with polio. The polio vaccines are developed and field tested, and thus the drop in polio rates in the Western world. The vaccine for whooping cough is credited to Midwestern public health scientists, Pearl Kendrick, Grace Ederling, and microscopist Lonnie Gordon. The whooping cough vaccine is popularized by Atlanta pediatrician, Lila Alice Denmark, and thus we reduce childhood morbidity and mortality from whooping cough. There are five basic types of vaccines, and I am grateful to the Berkshire Museum of Pittsfield, Massachusetts, where I photographed the vaccine models, which I will now show you. The first type of vaccine is the live attenuated virus vaccine, which uses a weakened form of the virus, such as we use for smallpox, TB, MMR vaccines, and shingles or varicella. In the viral coat, we have a weakened form of the virus with, in this case, the viral DNA being shown in the model. A second type of vaccine is the inactivated virus vaccine, where a killed form of the virus is used, such as the most popular polio vaccine in the United States, or your yearly flu shot, illustrated in this model of the decayed viral coat with the DNA inside. The third type of vaccine is the recombinant vaccine, which contains only the viral proteins of the virus, such as the whooping cough pertussis vaccine, the human papillomavirus vaccine, and the new Novavax COVID-19 vaccine. Here we see the viral proteins in the model, but no viral coat. A fourth type of vaccine is the RNA vaccine, which contains a piece of viral RNA inside a package of tiny molecules, such as the Pfizer and Moderna COVID-19 vaccines, and illustrated in this model of a viral molecular coat used to distribute the immunogen. The final type of vaccine are viral vector vaccines, which have a viral DNA strand inside a different weakened virus, such as the Ebola virus vaccine or the Johnson & Johnson AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccine, illustrated by this model, where we have this somewhat pentagonal uh, viral coat with the uh, viral DNA or RNA inside. Today, I've told you that the use of cowpox material rather than human material for preventing smallpox changed the name of the procedure from inoculation to vaccination. And I've told you a few stories of the women and men who were the pioneers of vaccinology, people whose work spanned the centuries in multiple continents, including Blossom the Cow. I've described five general types of vaccines. For those of you interested in further reading about this subject, here are three suggestions. The article I wrote a year or so ago about George Washington and mandatory smallpox vaccines, a biography of Waldemar Mordechai Wolpafkin, and a wonderful article in Smithsonian Magazine about the all women developed pertussis vaccine. Perhaps you want to take a screenshot of these articles or wait for the YouTube video to appear a day or so from now if you'd like to read these articles. Thank you for your attention. Good afternoon. I'm Marissa Montecalvo, and I'm speaking on the treatment of symptomatic outpatients. And should we prescribe one of the oral drugs or one of the IV drugs or just give everybody rest and chicken soup? I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. So the goal of treatment is to prevent 
severe disease, which is mechanical ventilation, hospitalization, death. Uh, and you've seen slides like this before. If you look at death due to COVID, and these are from CDC, from their Sentinel Hospital System, and you look at deaths by vaccination, there's no question that the unvaccinated have a much higher rate of death. But <clears throat> here in the Northeast and in many parts of the country, for persons over the age of 50, we run vaccination rates of 80 to 90% of the population has received primary vaccination against COVID-19. So who's at high risk? Well, CDC has done a very nice literature review on this, uh, putting together where there is enough data to say that these groups for sure, and this is the current list, I've organized it by organ system here. So you've got your pulmonary diseases, immunosuppressive situations, uh, cardiac, cerebral, vascular, and on the right. So these are clearly people at high risk for severe outcomes. And then the question becomes, what about just age alone, if you don't have any of this? Well, <clears throat> if we look at hospitalizations by age, there's no question that those over 65 have a higher rate of hospitalization. But of course, they also have a higher rate of underlying diseases. And at this point, CDC would consider age alone still definitely a risk factor for severe outcome. But I just wanna mention that the multivariate analyses that are needed to really tease out age alone, uh, we really don't have enough of those at this point. And there's a lot of overlapping data. So let's take a look at the drugs that are available to us. So I did this in accordance with the life cycle of SARS-CoV-2. So it starts with binding up in the left-hand corner and the monoclonal antibodies act at blocking that virus to receptor attachment. Virus goes intracellular, releases its RNA, then it produces polypeptides and those proteins have to be cleaved so that they're broken in the right places by proteases and then come back together around the RNA so that transcription can occur. Nirmitrelvir is a protease inhibitor. It blocks the correct breakdown of those proteins so they can't come back together correctly. Malnupiravir works later. It tricks the RNA and so that it can't have transcription occur correctly, and remdesivir prevents replication of the new RNA. Here are the studies that looked at the two oral drugs, nirmitrelvir and malnupiravir. So these are the studies that led to their emergency use authorization. Very similar studies looked at hospitalization and death for a month after use. These studies, importantly to point out, were done in unvaccinated persons while the Delta variant was in circulation, not during Omicron. Severely immunosuppressed persons were excluded. People were treated within five days of symptom onset and were treated for five days. And the drugs have different safety issues. Numitrelvir has drug-drug interactions, which we'll come to, as well as leaving a bad taste in your mouth, whereas malnupiravir has uh, theoretical concerns because it gets into the RNA that, gee, could it cause DNA mutations? And until more data available, it is not to be used in pregnancy children or women of childbearing potential. Now, when you look at these two trials, though, the risk reduction is quite different. Numitrelvir was 89%, malnupiravir was 30%. There's a subsequent study of nirmitrelvir from Israel during the Omicron variant, and also that included vaccinated persons, and the efficacy was 54% for the drug. I want to say a word about the issues of drug-drug interactions. Nirmitrelvir is paired with another drug, ritonavir. And ritonavir inhibits the CYP3A system of the liver, which breaks down drugs. And therefore, it allows for a higher level of nimitrelvir, which allows for its efficacy, but it also increases the levels of many other drugs. 
And so it is important to take a very good medication history when prescribing nimetrelvir. And in red are those that are contraindicated and in yellow are the drugs for which there is a warning. There's another issue that has come forth with these oral drugs and that's rebound COVID. And I would refer you to this article in JAMA because it's an interesting read. So what happened here is that David Ho, who's a very well-known HIV virologist, the director of the Aaron Diamond Center at Columbia, uh, got COVID, took nimetrelvir within 12 hours of symptom onset, tested negative by day four, uh, and then continued to test. And a few days later, tested positive again. So like any good HIV virologist, he went and sequenced both of his viruses and showed that they were identical. So this was not just a second infection, this was a relapse of the first. Now this occurs with some frequency. It's also reported with molnupiravir. It's not a reason not to use the drug, but it's something to be aware of. And most people get better within a few days. I want to say a few words about the IV options. So monoclonal antibodies are still out there. They just keep on changing to accommodate the variant that's in circulation. The current one that is active, bebtilavimab, uh, is active against Omicron, uh, and, but the authorization was based upon a small clinical study. However, there are good in vitro data. Remdesivir is a very well-known drug. It's been used for hospitalized patients for almost since the beginning of the pandemic. And when looked at in outpatients, given in three sequential days, it had an 87% risk reduction for hospitalization and death. But again, unvaccinated patients were in this trial. So where are we at? Well, if you look at the NIH treatment guidelines, first and foremost, yes, chicken soup is recommended for everyone. There is no question that rest, keeping your fluids up, um, and taking good care of yourself as you would during any viral illness is very important. But treatment, pharmacological treatment, is really for those at high risk of progression to severe disease. And the drug of choice would be first nimetrelvir, and these are the um, evidence uh, based recommendations with A being greater evidence than B or C. It's the easiest to use as long as there are no drug interactions. And then remdesivir would be next. And then alternatives would be bebtilavimab and molnupiravir. So in conclusion, uh, no question, chicken soup for everyone. Uh, I think treatment really should be targeted toward those at high risk for severe illness and not just be used blanketly across the board. Um, as any ID physician, uh, we often approach things in a very targeted manner, manner. And very importantly, I think it's important to prioritize access to treatment for the unvaccinated, as they are really um, at very, very high risk of complications and important that they have access to treatment. Uh, these are my references. I thank you very much for your attention and look forward to your questions. Hello again, this is Dr. Edward Halpern, your host, telling you how to get your continuing medical education credit. As always, we got lots of choices to get your CME credit. You can get out that cell phone and send a text message to 828-295-1144 and put in your text message 95WANS. If you do that, you're going to get a text message back telling you how to do your satisfaction questionnaire and how to get your credit. If you don't want to do a text message, type in www.eeds.com, click the sign in button, put in the same code 95WANS, W A N S, and it'll walk you through the process. Or get out that QR reader on your handheld device, scan the code and you'll find yourself in the right place 
to apply for your CME credit and answer your satisfaction questionnaire with today's program. These codes are gonna expire on Monday, August 29th. Let me strongly suggest you take a screenshot or you write this down and don't wait because you don't wanna be frustrated that you didn't get your CME credit when you had the chance. As always, if you have a question for our panelists, go ahead and type it in the Q&A box and we'll get to as many as we can when Dr. Kadish moderates our Q&A at the end of our panel presentations. And now back to our program. Back to school in 22, or as the song goes, will I see you in September or lose you to a COVID mask? I'm Dr. Robert Amler, and I have no conflicts to disclose. COVID today is not as bad, but it is still here, and strategy has not changed. You remember this, avoid exposure to prevent infection, vaccinate to protect from disease, test if symptoms occur, avoid exposing others if infected. But strategies still require implementation. And this is tough where schools are concerned because school is important too. And already more than two years have been lost for many teachers and students, as well as school administrators. What do schools do? They give us basic skills and competencies. They teach socialization, respect, conflict resolution. They affect the daily routines of working families and communities. And they impart, impart advanced skills and career development. In many ways, schooling is a vaccine against ignorance, bigotry, and even violence. So people of all persuasions are already asking, just how bad is COVID? How bad is this problem? Well, we can see from this slide, COVID incidence is in fact very low. We can see that from recent times during this pandemic with these large peaks that have been shown that we are now down to a much lower number of cases reported on a, a seven day moving average. Uh, this is Westchester. But we've got to remember that that number of 214 is highly suspect. Remember, these are reported cases. And in today's world, with so many people testing at home and not bothering to report their positive case, we know that the number of cases is obviously much, much higher. But still, even if not perfect, vaccine works vaccination works. Look at the comparison of cases here on the left among vaccinated versus unvaccinated, and especially look at the deaths under over here on the right, looking at deaths among unvaccinated versus vaccinated with extraordinarily low risk of death down here among the vaccinated population. These data through December but the relationship has still held. And this year, we have approvals for childhood vaccines in the six month to four year age group or five year age group, whether you're getting the Pfizer BioNTech version of the mRNA vaccine, or you're getting the Moderna version, you're getting two doses, certain period of time apart, either three weeks or one month. And in the case of the Pfizer version, you're getting a third dose at least eight weeks later. For the older children, five years to 17 years, it's still just two doses, three weeks apart with a booster at least five months later for Pfizer. For Moderna, two doses, one month apart and currently not eligible for a booster. There are somewhat different rules shown on this slide for the five year to 17 year age group for those who are moderately to severely immunocompromised. So that's enough for the rules, but what's the plan? 
And where is the plan? Is it a New York City plan? Is it a Philadelphia plan where masks are going to be required, I've read, uh, for the first several weeks of school and possibly for the youngest students for the entire school year? Well, in New York City, it's a different plan. Announced recently, face coverings will be optional. They are recommended for children who've been exposed to the virus, and they will still be required for children going to a medical office or a nurse's office in the school. Vaccine is strongly encouraged for children if they are eligible. And there are still rules for children who are sick. They should either test or stay home. Uh, if they are testing negative twice, they can return to school in New York City. If they test positive, they must stay home for five days or longer if they still have symptoms. Pay close attention and be flexible because these plans also may change as the incidence and prevalence of COVID infection in the New York City student population might also change. Well, if you're not in New York City, you have to look at your local jurisdiction. In Westchester, where New, York's, uh, New York Medical College is principally located, we have actually 43 public school districts from Ardsley to Yorktown. We have 95 private elementary, junior high, and special schools. We have 22 private high schools and 24 colleges and universities. So in Westchester, you need to know what district, what private school, what private college or public college or university you're dealing with, because these entities may have somewhat different rules on how to handle masking, how to handle people who are sick and whether they need to mask or isolate or test. Uh, there'll be similarities between all of them, and yet many of them will have slightly different nuances in terms of what is required. Are you confused? Yes, you are. This has been, has proven confusing for all of us, not just many. And because of that, communication becomes all important, not unusual in public health, because communication is really the key. I think the example that's shown here initially looks complicated. It's issued by New York City Department of Education. But in fact, if you go through these decision trees with your student uh, or you read them, go down the list, you will find that in fact, it's pretty well spelled out uh, in terms of what you're expected to do. And so I would actually commend New York City DOE for putting this out. Again, it looks a little tough when you first glance at it, but read it carefully. It's not that bad. Uh, other institutions, other jurisdictions are gonna have to put out similar communications to make sure people understand what's expected of them depending on their individual situation. And in fact, that's my recommendation to all of us at this point in time. And that is, let's consider safety first, but also the importance of school. Because if any adult or your child or child in your family is not up to date on COVID vaccine and boosters, is at increased risk for severe illness, is unable to physically distance, or is caring for or involved with patients who are sick or household members who are sick, or is involved in settings interacting with many unmasked people, or traveling or congregating with crowds, you need to consider the specifics of their situation as against the rules and regulations and policies of the schools that you are planning to send them to or planning to attend. So in summary, Come back to that song, See You in September. It ends with, have a good time, but remember, 
there is danger and there is virus. So make sure that your student is vaccinated and follow the changing rules as much as you can. Thank you and stay healthy. Hello again, this is your host, Dr. Edward Halperin. Uh, I'd like to offer you a thought for those of you who are fired up with interest in public health based on these webinars or on some of the medical ethics questions we grapple with. If you're interested in some coursework or even a master's degree in public health, go to nymc.edu slash COVIDPH and you can learn all about our course offerings, certificate programs, and degree programs in these disciplines. For those of you interested in medical ethics, nymc.edu slash COVID ethics for our full range of courses available online and in person about medical ethics. Perhaps you have a family member or a child interested in these disciplines and everyone's welcome. Well, we hope you've enjoyed our panel presentations today and now it's time for our question and answer period with our moderator, Dr. Alan Kadish. Dr. Kadish, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Dr. Halpern. And I'd like to thank the presenters for another great webinar. I'm Dr. Alan Kadish, the president of Torrey University and New York Medical College. And I'm happy to be here today to go through what's been a great series of questions from today's audience. So I'll start with the first series of questions for Dr. Robert Amler. Dr. Amler, uh, there's some questions here that relate to testing after or before greetings and after or before travel. And so the two interrelated questions are, first of all, what sort of testing would you recommend after international travel or potentially after large congregations? And um, is a home test enough? a home rapid test, or do you think we need still to do PCR testing in that circumstance? Thank you for that question, and greetings, everybody. Uh, of course, uh, the basic rule with all testing is, in nearly all cases, a positive test, regardless of the kind of test, should be treated as a positive. Whether you're doing a home test or PCR, uh, positive is positive and must be treated as such. In many cases uh, with symptoms or following an exposure, a, uh, a negative home test uh, done on a couple of days, three or four days apart should be satisfactory. But if there is a question of going into areas where people are at greater risk of exposure or taking extended trips, the more definitive answer is a PCR test. It's a little more difficult to get, and that's why. In many cases, it should work to do a home test first, follow up with a PCR if you're having symptoms. And thank you for the question. Sure. Um, would you test uh, before and after international travel routinely? Great question about international travel. Uh, all international travel introduces the traveler to new situations settings that are not as predictable. And remember, in the conveyances in international travel, you have a lot more people come, you're coming in contact with who have come from other parts of the world as well. So in the case of international travel, I uh, typically recommend to my friends and colleagues that they look at the current version of the CDC website to see what CDC is advising on travel to the particular countries they're planning to go to. It'll depend uh, on uh, what the background rates of COVID are. And there may be certain pockets within that country or certain cities that are at higher risk. I also recommend people go to the State Department website, that's state.gov, because sometimes there are other issues related to physical safety that must be considered if there's any kind of uh, violence or uh, problems in a country, you should be aware if you're traveling. And remember that when you travel and you go in other time zones, you are more uh, vulnerable to getting into accidents, 
uh, crossing the streets the wrong way and so forth. So international travel requires extra focus on safety at all levels. And thank you for the question. Sure. And so one last question. Just a few days ago, the CDC updated some of their guidelines to uh, make isolation uh, and testing uh, actually less onerous for people who were exposed. There's been some controversy about it because I guess they're no longer recommending routine isolation after positive testing. So uh, what, what's your thoughts about that? Are we ready to do that? Or uh, do you think isolation should still be recommended? Thanks for that question as well. Uh, CDC did make those changes. And uh, this I see as the natural progression in the gradual uh, set, uh, step down from what was a calamitous worldwide emergency. Uh, it is natural, entirely natural, to gradually relax some of the restrictions and some of the provisos as the situation becomes less uh, risky, less dangerous. And so uh, I'm very encouraged that the CDC has uh, issued these latest changes. They were also uh, questioned in terms of their overall approach to COVID, which has changed during the course of the pandemic. And again, I think it's entirely natural that the response to a situation changes as the situation itself changes, which is what's happened. Thank you for the question. Sure. Thank you, Dr. Amlin. We'll turn just for a moment to Dr. Halpern, who gave us a, a wonderful history of vaccination. One of the questioners uh, has heard the term variolation and wanted to know uh, how that differed from inoculation and vaccination and where does that fit in? And, and what's the history of variolation? Um, variola is a Latin word that means pox or pustule. <clears throat> <clears throat> the word variola enters the English language in the 18th century. The word variolation refers to a whole host of attempts to prevent people from getting smallpox. Now, I told you about one type of variolation, which was inoculation. Another type dates from China in the 15th and 16th century. And for those of you who are listening carefully to Professor Barrett and Professor Bakshi, you'll see that all new ideas are often old. In the 15th and 16th century, the Chinese would take smallpox scabs, pustules, let them dry in the sun, sometimes mix them with musk, and using a pipe, blow it in the nose of people to prevent them from getting smallpox. They even had a ritual uh, whether you blew it in the right nostril or the left nostril for males versus females. And what we have from Chinese data is that it was reasonably effective at preventing uh, smallpox. So variola means pox, variolation, any attempt to try to prevent smallpox, subtypes of variolation, inoculation, scraping the skin, or insufflation into the nose. Thanks for the question. Sure. Thank you, Dr. Halpern. There are actually a couple of questions for me. Uh, one question suggests that there's an association of atrial fibrillation with COVID-19 infection and or the vaccine. For those who aren't medical health care professionals, atrial fibrillation is a rapid irregular heartbeat originating in the upper chamber of the heart that carries some risk with it, including a risk of stroke. Um, and, and the question is, what's my opinion of the risk of atrial fibrillation with infection or the vaccine? So this is a complicated issue. Uh, the best study that I know about that addresses this issue was published in circulation in April of this year. And what that study showed was the following. If you look at the incidence of new episodes of atrial fibrillation in patients who have COVID-19, you do indeed see an increased incidence of atrial fibrillation. But after you correct for other things that are going on, like lung shortness, lung disease, shortness of breath, heart failure, et cetera, the association of atrial fibrillation with COVID goes away. So as far as what I believe the best evidence of the relationship with 
of atrial fibrillation to COVID infection is that simply atrial fibrillation is what we refer to as an epiphenomena, meaning it happens when there's bad disease, but there's no specific association of atrial fibrillation with COVID-19 infection. And I would say the same is probably true of vaccination. There are a small number of cases of myocarditis with COVID-19 vaccination, particularly with the mRNA, RNA vaccines, as you've heard earlier today. And some of those people will develop heart function changes and inflammation of the heart, and there'll be an association of atrial fibrillation there, but not because there's any specific association of atrial fibrillation with the vaccine, but rather that when people do develop heart disease, there is an incidence of atrial fibrillation. A second related question is the question of spike protein being associated with atrial fibrillation and with myocarditis. And based on experimental data that Invermectin at low doses binds the spike protein, perhaps one could think about using Invermectin to prevent atrial fibrillation or treat myocarditis that's related to the vaccine. There are a lot of drugs that theoretically can help prevent viral infection and its consequences, and in particular in the case of the COVID-19 infection, uh, present, prevent the storm of immunologic release that can cause some of the adverse effects. The problem is that when many of those therapies have been subjected to clinical trials, they haven't shown to be effective. And so far, and of course, there could be additional studies, but so far, Invermectin has not shown to be effective in controlled clinical trials. So while it's a theory that's worth investigating, at this point, I don't think there's enough evidence to suggest that we should use Invermectin to prevent atrial fibrillation, to treat atrial fibrillation, or prevent or treat myocarditis. So the next series of questions is for Dr. Bakshi. Welcome back, Dr. Bakshi, who's been uh, at pretty much every one of these webinars. You with us, Dr. Bakshi? He's just sent an email saying that due to uh, yes, but my oh. connection is very unstable. <laughs> so oh. okay. uh, it's very interrupted. I, I, okay, I well, it's uh, good to see you for now. You look pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's hope we can uh, get some stability in your answers here. So what do you think about the timeline for the new vaccines, particularly, I guess, most interestingly, the universal vaccine might be? I think what we're going to do is move on to Dr. Barrett, and hopefully Dr. Box, you'll be able to get to a place where he has a better connection. So for Dr. Barrett, uh, you told us about 11 different vaccines that are available worldwide and four in the United States. So is that enough? Do we need more vaccines? Do you think there's a lot of duplication happening? What's, what's your thought about developing new vaccines? That's a great question. And we're, we're actually seeing it, seeing it real time in terms of our interactions with the biotech and pharmaceutical industry in terms of there is a, as we had hoped, a big flurry of activity to develop vaccines. That, that is winding down. And even the new Novavax vaccine, its penetration into the market is very minimal here in the US uh, compared to the, the primary vaccines of Mo Moderna and uh, the Pfizer vaccine. And so we expect to see that going forward, that there's gonna be less uh, broad activity in terms of developing uh, new COVID vaccines, uh, but more targeted uh, towards a universal vaccine or a mucosally delivered vaccine. So we're going to see lower activity, but more targeted activity, I think, in, in terms of developing new vaccines. And thank you for the question. Sure. Um, there are a couple more for you. Um, you described how Novavax vaccine has an adjuvant to increase the immune response. Do other COVID-19 vaccines have adjuvants and when, how are they used? Uh, so again, a good question. The, the, Vaccines we're familiar with uh, here in the US, uh, the mRNA vaccines um, and the uh, J&J &J vaccine, um, they do not require uh, adjuvant to induce their immune response, uh, whereas the Novavax vaccine does. 
Will there be other new vaccines coming along at COVID that might rely on an adjuvant? Possibly if they take that protein uh, subunit approach where we're trying to deliver a protein to the body, just delivering a protein to the body doesn't induce a very good immune response. So that's why we need that adjuvant on board to activate our immune system to see that protein and make a good uh, response to it. Thank you for that question as well. Sure. Um, do you think that some of the COVID-19 vaccines will be better for the economically, less economically developed world? Um, are some cheaper or some easier to distribute or some easier to store? Absolutely. So where no, the new Novavax vaccine may find traction is actually in, in other countries around the world. Uh, comparatively, it's uh, more stable. It's cold chain storage uh, has less requirements than the mRNA vaccines. So one can envision that it's not just cost uh, that might, might drive a, a vaccine's uptake uh, in other parts of the world, but how it needs to be stored, how easily uh, can it be made. Uh, the Novavax vaccine has now been licensed out to the Serum Institute of India, so it can be easily made in other places around the world. So it'll probably find more penetration in other parts of the world than actually here in the US. Thanks again for that question. Sure, there's another question about um, antibody levels and neutralization titers at predicting the effectiveness of vaccines. Do, do you recommend that people test antibody responses or titers after getting vaccination and, and how good are they at predicting, predicting effectiveness? Oh, that, that's a great question. And it, it really kind of inter, it is intertwined with a, a bit of controversy of how do we determine and approve uh, new vaccines coming online uh, with doing less um, stu uh, studies in human patients. Uh, can we use uh, the level of neutralizing antibodies in animals or in a small number of patients to predict how a new vaccine might behave? Certainly as one gains more experience with COVID, there is a good correlation between neutralizing antibody levels and the potential level of protection. Um, so it can be a useful metric, but there is still quite a bit of controversy uh, in terms of how much should we rely on that to prove uh, how reliable a vaccine may be. Good question. Yeah, so I'm gonna keep you on the spot for a bit, Dr. Barrett. By the way, Dr. Barrett's at the Lovelace Biomedical Research Institute. Uh, that just joined the Turo University system a couple of weeks ago. So we're really excited to have him as part of the team here uh, and a great talk today. I'm going to actually um, ask you a couple of the questions that were directed to Dr. Bakshi, but ones that I think overlap enough with what you talked about that hopefully uh, you can help us out with him since he seems to be having some trouble uh, sure. getting in here. So I know, I know that Lovelace has done some work on nasal vaccines. So tell us if you can, well, publicly information av there's available about the ones that you think are furthest along in development and what that might involve. Sure. So you're right. We had the uh, fortunate uh, to be involved in a collaboration uh, looking at uh, new nasal delivered or oral delivered vaccines. And I guess the, the future, what the future might hold with those is uh, some of those are emerging into clinical trials. We'll, we'll have to wait and see. Uh, uh, how how well uh, they might uh, protect. But I guess the, the potential for a mucosal vaccine is not only will they potentially protect the individual, but it may also lead to protection from transmission of virus to other individuals. Um, that's really the hope with some of these uh, mucosal vaccines as we induce an immune response that will prevent uh, transmission of virus uh, to other individuals around that individual. So that's that's some of the hope for the uh, mucosal vaccine vaccines. And of course, we'll just have to keep our fingers crossed uh, and see in these uh, clinical trials, hopefully they'll be successful and um, they'll, they'll emerge as uh, an improvement on existing vaccines. Right, so just to clarify, the reason you think that they might be better at preventing transmission is because presumably they'll produce higher level of upper respiratory and nasal antibodies. Um, Cause we now know that even if you're vaccinated and protected against infection, you can still potentially transmit the virus. 
That's that's correct. So the the idea would be that with a nasally delivered vaccine, you're you're triggering an immune response right in the upper respiratory uh, regions. Uh, so producing uh, antibodies in the upper respiratory tract in in the nasal regions, developing. Uh, uh, cell-mediated immunity at those specific regions that can better uh, attack the virus in those regions to reduce viral levels uh, such that uh, we're not going to be transmitting them to other individuals. That's great. Thank you so much. So now I have a series of questions for Dr. Montecalvo. Uh, do you want to join us again? There you go. Great to see you. So, um, Tell us, uh, there's a question about the fourth shot and age. So I guess the fourth shot is now recommended for people over 50. Um, what's magic about 50? Why is the fourth shot different? And do, do you think those recommendations are well-crafted? What's magic about 50? <laughs> it's good to be 50. <laughs> uh, so, you know, it, but those recommendations on the fourth shot were based upon data that uh, ACIP looked at, the American College of Immunization Practices. And, you know, there's no question that there's waning immunity with these vaccines. So is the 35-year-old uh, going to have the same waning immunity? Probably, uh, but they're just less at risk for severe infection. And I believe that they chose 50 when that was discussed uh, back in the spring, it was all based upon uh, the data that were available. Okay, that's great. So um, the next question for Dr. Montecalvo uh, relates to uh, what is the therapy, if any, of someone who's still testing positive 10 days after having gotten coronavirus? Would you recommend any therapy? Or at that point, is it simply waiting clinically to hopefully let the infection and the viral load disappear? I, uh, yeah, so, I mean, someone who was treated uh, or was not treated, but is just continuing to test positive, which certainly can occur, uh, particularly in someone who's immunosuppressed, uh, you can test positive for quite some time. Uh, you know, if you're continuing to test positive, uh, most people would continue some form of isolation, uh, uh, although over time, the likelihood of transmission goes down uh, with, e with each day. Uh, but I think the therapeutically, the main thing would be to really just rest, and it, it really is totally symptom dependent as to whether, you know, you might need anything else, but there are no indications for another line of treatment at that point. So let's talk a little bit about the rebound with Paxlovid that you talked about. Um, do you think we ought to do a better job looking for rebound? Is there any treatment for rebound? How do we deal with rebound? Or is it, again, just a wait and see attitude? Yeah, so rebound is a very interesting uh, situation. So first of all, I, I want to emphasize that it's thought to be about 6% of treated people. So that means 94% of people are not rebounding, right? And it's also been described with malnupiravir. Uh, and there may be some rebound with natural infection as well. So, uh, but I do not know of cases of transmission during rebound. Rebound after uh, nirmatrelvir, ritonavir is a limited situation, usually lasting a few days, if symptomatic at all. Uh, with David Ho, it was just, you know, he tested himself uh, with Dr. Ho, but, uh, you know, uh, it's usually a self-limited situation, and I don't know of any risk of transmission during that time, although clearly if you knew you were positive again, you would be um, uh, caught very cautious. But I don't see an indication to be looking for it, to be continually testing yourself after you're better and after you've completed isolation. I don't really think makes sense at this point. Remember that uh, even with the with the current isolation guidelines in New York, which is which are five days of isolation, you are supposed to continue to wear a face mask at all times um, for the full ten days. 
So you are mitigating other, you know, uh, the potential for transmission, even if you were in a situation of some rebound. So I, I don't think at this point it really makes sense outside of a clinical study to be routinely looking for a positive test after treatment. Thank you. Thanks. So one last question for Dr. Montecalvo, which is, um, do you think older age alone, and, and I guess what age, is enough of a risk factor that if you develop COVID-19 infection, you should be treated uh, with antiviral agents, monoclonal antibodies, or would you only treat people who are significantly ill or have comorbidities? Yeah, that's a really tough question. Uh, so as I said in the presentation, age alone is thought to be a risk factor for severe outcomes, but it's highly intertwined with underlying disease. So take the person who's in their mid-70s, right, and has none of those underlying diseases and is and would have no drug-drug interactions. So it would be completely safe to give them nirmatrelvir, ritonavir. Uh, you know, I think it's an individual decision. I would lean toward treating them, uh, but it's, you know, remember that you have five days from symptom onset. Some people are better in 12 hours. Uh, so if you're already feeling better, I'm not sure that, you know, you, you have to push that hard to treat. Um, I think it's very much an individual decision. But yes, as you get older and, you know, certainly into your 70s, 80s, uh, age alone is probably a good reason for treatment, but it's an individual decision. And that assumes no risk from treatment. Remember, if there are drug-drug interactions, it's a completely different situation. Thank, Thank you, you so much. So I understand we have Dr. Bakshi back. And so we have a couple of questions left over for you. Welcome back. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so tell us a little, about, a little more about immune imprinting and whether immune imprinting is a problem, say, with the flu vaccine which changes year to year, but where there are presumably some similarities of the virus coming along? Uh, so that's, that's an excellent question. You know, Im immune imprinting has been extensively studied uh, in the context of flu. And it was originally described as like uh, orig uh, antigenic sin, you know, because like if, if your body has seen an antigen earlier, um, it will respond to that rather than a similar type of uh, antigen as in the form of a vaccine if it is coming next. Um, so the, the response will go to the previous one. Um, so, um, uh, so this has been studied extensively in the flu vaccine and that's why you know now the, uh, the direction that the vaccine field is taking is to develop a universal vaccine. That means you have been targeting the conserved region of the HA antigen. Um, so basically, uh, it's not immunogenic on its own, uh, but if you engineer it with the hemagglutinin antigen, then you can make it more immunogenic. So that is the approach that is being taken, you know, to avoid uh, this uh, this phenomena of immune imprinting um, in uh, in the flu field, and and this is what we are also seeing um, with uh, with the COVID nineteen uh, or SARS CoV two variants. Um, so, so again, the one of the approaches that will be extremely successful would be to uh, develop a vaccine that targets the conserved region of all the uh, spike protein epitopes uh, that are used, you know, or, or, or they, that induce a really good immune response against it. Uh, thank you so much for this question. Sure. And so for our last question uh, or questions, we're going to go to uh, a couple of other diseases that have made the news. So Dr. Barrett, tell us a little bit about the monkeypox vaccine. Well, it's certainly timely, um, but the, we do have monkeypox vaccines and they, they do rely on uh, similar approaches that we took with uh, smallpox, of course, back in the day. They, they are live attenuated uh, vaccines um, that uh, have shown to work quite well. Um, it's just a matter of we, we need to get more of it out there into the community and get those individuals who are at most risk uh, vaccinated. So there are two different clinically available vaccines, is that right? There there are. So uh, I forget the name of uh, one, one of the companies that makes it, uh, but there are two, one from uh, Santa Fe uh, and then one from a, a smaller uh, company that uh, both make vaccines. One, one appears to be a little bit uh, safer than the other. Uh, one does have uh, some uh, 
cardiac uh, risks associated with it, uh, but there are two choices. Great. And the very last question is for Dr. Amler. Um, it's about polio. Should we be worried about this? Uh, what's going on? Uh, there's polio in the water. Is that what I hear? Polio, in a sense, is always around at some level, and the real risk is controlled by vaccination. In the New York area, we have a very highly immunized indigenous population, and the risk always is going to be from cases imported from other parts of the world. The vast majority of, act, of active infections are not paralytic, even when they occur. So um, even a small amount of circulating virus is not going to pose a great risk. But we saw that in an unfortunate instance or more that uh, someone who's not fully vaccinated gets the virus, goes on to paralytic disease. So once again, the theme of these webinars many times has been vaccinate, vaccinate, vaccinate. And in the case of polio, you want to make sure that you've had your primary series, which happened for most of us in early childhood, infancy. Uh, and if there's any question, uh, it never hurts to check that vaccine record and getting an injectable dose of uh, inactivated polio vaccine is always an extra measure of safety, particularly if you're traveling to parts of the world where there could still be endemic pockets of polio. And thanks for the question. Sure. Thanks a lot, Dr. Amler and the panel. And thanks for the audience, to the audience for some great questions. And uh, unfortunately, uh, I think, uh, although we love to talk with you, I think we'll see you again in six weeks because I don't think uh, COVID-19 is gone quite yet. Have a great day and stay healthy. And as Dr. Amler said, vaccinate, vaccinate, vaccinate.